Osiris. We lived together in a few different houses, but the first one was called Fellows Road. We all lived together and we painted the nights, sort of psychedelic murals of King Arthur and Merlin and things like this on the on the wall. And we, we hung all these painted wall hangings I'd brought back from India. And we created this thing we called Mong Corner, which was a place that everyone would lie when they were too stoned to stand up. to Discog Graffiti, the music obsessives podcast that gives freaks like you and me the chance to connect with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. I am thrilled to announce that we have partnered with the podcast network Osiris Media, the leading storyteller in music. You can check out all their music podcasts at OsirisPod.com. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on Cool as Shaker and the albums that shaped them. Along with our very special guests, Coolest Shakers, Crispy and Mills, and Paul Winterhart. Over the course of this episode, we discuss the ace up Crispy and Sleeve when he's stuck on how to work his way out of a guitar break, the album he refers to as, quote, Secret Ingredient X for Coolest Shaker, and Crispian's vote for the greatest psychedelic song of all time. If you're a Kula Shaker super fan like me, you'll want to turn this free version off right now and opt for the director's cut of this episode, which is located on our Patreon page. It features 11 minutes of essential additional material, including a release that we had to cut for time, as well as kick-ass rock nerd repartee I hereby deem unskippable. And you can find the director's cut in our Patreon record shop for mere pennies at patreon.com slash discograffiti slash shop. Or just subscribe for the complete versions of all our shows. Even if you're on the fence, just head over there because it's finally free to become a basic member. Coming up, we've got Robert Schneider rating the Strawberry Alarm Clock, an interview with Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music, the Lemon Twigs, and the three surviving Dedrick siblings rating everything they ever released as one of the greatest bands of all time, bar none, the Free Design. Oh, and Michelle Phillips, along with Mamas and Papas biographer Richard Campbell rating everything they ever did. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. And away we go then. Before we start, I want to say that I've never had such quick lead time on what it was that I was doing with a guest. I pulled it all together and I've been working on it nonstop for, you know, except for sleeping for 24 hours. And I got to thank you for it because in the interest, especially of your combined spiritual pursuits, it's going to allow me to be in the moment in a way that my steadfastly compulsive researching ass will never, ever let me do with any of my episodes. So thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. That's very good. Spontaneity is the key. But don't be fooled. I research the living shit out of everything. And away we go then. Today's guests are from the most 60s influenced Brit popular band of them all. So it's absolutely no surprise that they're being feted on the feedy. Cool as shakers shot to the toppermost of the poppermost right out of the gate during the late 90s as their debut album K hit number one on the UK albums chart and they piled up a slew of top 10 hits, including Tatva, Hey Dude, Govinda, Hush, and Sound of Drums. Their interest in traditional Indian music and mysticism ain't at all ornamental. In fact, it runs deep. Their name is derived from King Kulasakara, an Indian king from the 9th century. And a number of their songs feature Sanskrit lyrics, not to mention a consistent implementation of traditional Indian instruments such as sitar, tambora, and tabla. After taking an extended hiatus, the band released their sixth album, First Congregational Church of Eternal Love and Free Hugs, in June 2022. And their newest LP, Natural Magic, just dropped, so to speak. And as always, thank God, it's equal parts within you without you, and I am the resurrection. 
It also happens to be up there with the very best of their entire catalog. And as we all know, it's not supposed to work that way. But hey, that's what fucking happens when examining your insides takes precedence over an overfocus on pop star bullshit. Lads and ladies, both the Yanks who've been feeling 30 years of cool as shaking, and especially the lords and birds out there across the pond, the ones who put pet sounds and forever changes on the charts when we had no damn clue what to make of them will you please clap your hands and rattle your jewelry for a couple of rock and roll seekers trying to find the key to 50 million fables it's coolest shakers crispy and mills and paul winterhart yay what a great intro thanks guys i tried to throw as many uk easter eggs in there as possible that was fantastic. It's kind of like a psychedelic Muppet show. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I, I don't know if you're referring to the intro or your own discographical catalog. <laughs> yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's a long-term listener of Discography knows that I am incapable of lying. So if there's any new listeners out there crooking a brow, thinking that I received payola to shower kudos on your new record, I advise anyone out there to check out the Garage Farfisa moves of Indian record player and the stunning blend of Indian and mariachi on Churalia, You Stole My Heart. It's a really great piece of work. I'm sure you're incredibly proud of it. Cool, thank you. It was fun to do, you know. We spent a month down in Brighton. We're swimming in the sea every day and we had Jay back, so we'll fondly remember doing this record. I mean, to me, it's got some of your best moments in your entire career on it and some of your most playful moments too as a band because I can only imagine, and we're going to sublimate our own accomplishments and things of that nature for a lot of this episode, but you know, I can only imagine after the initial struggles of the band that when you had you know such an incredibly huge smash hit right out of the gate, quote unquote overnight success, that there's got to be that nagging urge to try to make sure that that doesn't slip. And whether or not that was ever a consideration, three decades into the band's existence, you guys are still shoving very interesting meats into the sausage grinder of your influence pool. Yeah, who knows what's around the corner? I mean, you know, there is a tradition. It's rare, I think, of artists kind of getting better as they get older. I don't know. It's like Akira Kurosawa or someone like They have different distinct chapters in their career and then they don't lose their energy. And I, I think pop stars and musicians tend to be more like athletes. You know, they can only redo it in, when you're young. It's all in the mind, isn't it? That attitude and that energy. So if you stay vital and mentally switched on, then you can keep doing it. I think we got re-energized by Jay's return for sure. But also, you know, making a hit record and making an album that kind of grabs the audience, that's that's an intention. And when you make that decision, that's the kind of record you want to make. It creates a sort of wave of energy. Are you all big film fans? Because if you're dropping a Kurosawa reference, there's no way I'm not going to bite on that chum. Chomp away. <laughs> so are you a Louis Bunuel fan as well? He's not somebody that really speaks to me. It's one of those people that, you know, you respect. But it's a bit like kind of obscure jazz, you know. I can I can appreciate it for its cubist, abstract kind of uh, surrealism. But no, it's not something I, I've been kind of moved by. Well, you did put The Graduate soundtrack. That is my favorite movie of all time. So I figured we would be dipping into filmic waters here. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, one thing that happened to me over these decades is I came to the realization that I was a frustrated filmmaker, even when I was making albums. And if I was making a film, I was also being a frustrated musician, <laughs> because it's a way of telling stories. And from the very beginning, when we were making demos, they were very ambitious, they were very sort of cinematic and we were always talking about widescreen you know even when we were working on an eight track demo machine in some flat in Kilburn we're still thinking about it in terms of transporting the listener to a place in their head all my favorite music had that visual kind of element to it and and sometimes it's not so obvious like Sgt Pepper or something it can be a live record I mean first time I heard Deep Purple live in Japan I was at a gig and I was totally transported there's no overdubs on that record that's what they say 
That is what they say. It does make a good story. All right. So since you're providing such an inescapable entry point into the list, let me first go over the rules because typically we do a discographical trawl, but I love what you guys have done here, you know, this specific list. So the episode rules here are we're going to astrally project ourselves back into our scrawny, wiry, awkward, prepubescent bodies and ears, if only for a couple hours, back to a time before we'd even given serious consideration to following our maniacally demanding muses. Back when we were just super nerdy super fans, and all we ever dreamed of was spreading the good word about that constant sound that emanates from within us and without us like a delicate net draped so snugly and necessarily across the cosmos. The world in which we're living for the next couple hours will be devoid of all the pressures our manifested dreams have forced us to deal with. Pressures that gift us with the quickened pulses, insistent headaches, and never-ending complexity of the work-family balancing act. And just like that, we are those kids again. So, guys, Crispy and Paul, if you will, I would love for you to describe the soil in which your dreams were planted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We know to whatever extent who you are today, but what I want to know, and I'm sure what your listeners and fanatics want to know, is from whence you come. So you put together a list of 15 records. Initially, it was going to be 10, but I love that it's expanded. It's broken down in theme that's informed who you are today and has made you ineffably what you produce today as well. So let's start with the theme of live, live in Japan, Deep Purple. We were thinking about these records and we were figuring out, well, you know, how do we agree on this? Because everybody's so, you know, Paul and myself and Alonzo and Jay, we, we overlap, but there's quite a big difference in terms of the albums that, you know, knocked us for six. And, and I think that, you know, this record was like an entry point into the world of 70s hard rock. And from this album, Deep Purple Live in Japan, came, you know, Led Zeppelin and all those other bands. Rainbow Rising. <laughs> Rainbow Rising. And I think, you know, without Live in Japan, you know, you wouldn't have got to, to everything else. But Live in Japan in itself, it kind of encapsulated the wildness and the danger of these bands that were also really great players. And I think that that's the balance that, that really struck me was that, you know, as you get older and you look back on it, you realize that, you know, being a great musician is also just about being free. And a lot of the musicians that copied Deep Purple and kind of came in their wake, they've become obsessed with becoming technically brilliant. And they they lost all that freedom and that and that wildness. And that's what you get with, with Live in Japan. It just breathes. It's got, it got a wonderful freedom to it. And it's very, very ex exciting. And the definitive recordings of Highway Star and Smoke on the Water are not on Machine Head. They are not the studio recordings. The definitive recording is them playing live. And that is what Color Shake has always been. We take great pride in our records, but the tracks never really fully manifest until we've gone and played them live. And so it's formed our identity and it also brought us this obsession with the Hammond organ. <laughs> so for a long time, we were, you know, when I was at college with Alonzo, we we're like, we got to get a guy who can play an organ like is on that record. You know, what, what that's, what's on that Deep Purple record? That sound, the sound that sounds like a werewolf is playing. There's a famous actor and musician in England called Roy Castle. I don't know if he's known in America. He was in films like the Hammer House films and he was in Doctor Who and the Daleks with Peter Cushing as a much beloved English actor, a fantastic trumpet player as well. And I went to school with his son and his son gave me this record and it completely, completely blew my mind. And I remember going home at the weekend just wanting to go out and get a Deep Purple record. And I went to a store near me 
It was a vinyl store. It was full of like old guys and metalheads and Metallica fans. And, you know, it was very much of the, so the late 80s where rock music was congregating in these old record stores. And I picked out this album that had Deep Purple written on it. And it was Deep Purple in rock. And it had all their faces as Mount Rushmore. And I remember thinking it looked pretty impressive. And I went over to the desk to buy this record. I must have been 11 or 12. And I pushed it across the desk and this old rocker looked at it and he looked up at me. And there was just this moment of silence. And he said, that is a very important record. <laughs> He felt like he was initiating me. That is one of the greatest albums of all time. You know, those moments for him were important. I got to say that In Rock is my favorite Deep Purple record. The cover is completely iconic and untoppable. And the music <laughs> on that is, to me, the template of what makes them so great as a band. Yeah, and it's one of those albums that you're not sure what side A or side B is, you know, because it opens with Flight of the Rat. And I thought that was the A-side, but actually Speed King was supposed to be the A-side. But I, I put Flight the Rat on. I thought that's how it opened up. And it was just like this 10-minute flurry of guys riffing. <laughs> yeah, it is very exciting. So it's interesting to me that you wound up covering and having a hit with the Mach 1 Deep Purple. Yeah, we just used to play the Hush as a, just a, something in the show. If we ever felt like our show needed a lift, like the audience needed a kick up the arse, we would play Hush for a bit of fun. And it became a recording that we did. It was the end of the year, right, Paul? It was just for like a fan. Thank you for supporting yeah, I Kay. Mean, I hadn't heard the original. I didn't really grow up with Purple. I had never heard Hush. It was just something that we used to just jam, yeah. And then... Someone said, oh, why don't we record it? We were in LA to record something else. We were at Sound City in LA due to do a session for something else. We were excited to be at the studio because Nevermind had been done there and rumours had been done there. So we were really excited to be at this iconic studio. And we were there to record something else. And we did Hush just almost as an afterthought. And it turned out really well. So we decided to put it out. And it was Deep Purple's first single. Actually, Deep Purple and Richie Blackmore especially he was my huge influence so it was destiny that that track was so huge for us Action! and now an important message from don bowles dan kapelovitz is the only candidate for district attorney of los angeles who has over a decade of experience successfully defending those falsely accused of crimes Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate running for Los Angeles District Attorney who is dedicated to ending mass incarceration. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney who co-created and produced the televised freakout public access show known as The Three Geniuses, which the LA Weekly dubbed the most intentionally psychedelic show on television. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney who is an accomplished folk Phototheraminist. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney who now has a record label with punk rock legend and all-around weirdo Don Bowles. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate running for Los Angeles District Attorney who was not only the features editor at Hustler Magazine, but also Larry Flint's editorial point man for his First Amendment lawsuit against the military industrial complex and the Pentagon. If you believe in liberty, justice, and the American way, vote for Dan Kapelovitz. Stick it to the man. Vote for Dan. Dan Kapelovitz. I'm Dan Kapelovitz, and I approve this message. I don't know if you guys are at all fans of Southern Rock, but the Almond Brothers, who are an equally iconic band of their genre, you know, same era, same super quick peak, and then, you know, direct slide down the mountain. I mean, we're looking at a five-year purple patch for both Deep Purple and Almond Brothers, and yet they're still gods of their own genre. Yeah, British rock, you know. I think Deep Purple were less hippie and less mystical than Led Zeppelin, but they were my entry point. They were the gateway to a whole world of rock and, and guitar playing. I mean, I worshipped Richie Blackmore when I was 12 years old. <laughs> and uh, the kids at school used to make fun of me. He used to go, Richie! 
And I used to wear black, you know, like all black, just like, I wasn't like an emo or a goth or anything. I was just, you know, I was into Richie Blackmore. Yeah, I've got the piss taken out of me quite rightly. That's great. Did you attend any Renaissance fairs as a youth? <laughs> I, I played at Renaissance fair. I toured in the States playing Renaissance fair. You toured Renaissance fairs? Yeah. That's amazing. Was, my wife used to sing in a band called the Medieval Babes and... After she left them, I toured with them in the States. Wow. At Renaissance Fair. That's incredible. <laughs> I've actually been working with uh, the guy that started this podcast with me for the last 15 years on a triple album rock opera about elves that starts off at a Renaissance Fair. First song is called Renaissance Unfair. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> What happens at a Renaissance fair stays at a Renaissance fair. Except if, if you're Paul Winterhart. <laughs> yeah, he's built to be. All right, so moving on to the next one. The theme is Garage. And this is one of, I think, two records that I hadn't heard, although I knew a bunch of the songs on it. Get Primitive, The Best of Pebbles, Volume 1, The Originals, which came out in 1986. Now, there's a lot of crossover here with myself and Jay. And I turned Alonzo onto it as well. And Paul had to catch up, but we'll come to that because we have an album that... I was dragging my heels. Yeah, Paul was living in Glastonbury in a very different sort of farming community. <laughs> and we were in the city listening to this old stuff. But Get Primitive was a compilation that was put together and someone gave it to me on vinyl. My cousin, my older cousin, gave it to me on vinyl. It had artwork by Rudy Petrudi from the Fuzz Tones. And it had all these classic tracks. You still can't get a lot of them on Spotify, I'm happy to say. It's still obscure. The, the sort of classic masterpieces of 60s garage rock. These are bands, some of them never made albums. You know, they'd make, they went into some local recording studio, cut a legendary track, and then two of them went off to Vietnam and the band split up, you know. It was these stories that you get about the Electras or whoever, you know, the groupies, <laughs> these bands. And it's the simplicity of the songwriting and the kind of gothic theatre of it all and the complete lack of any political correctness, like be a caveman. <laughs> oh, be a caveman. Keep her in line. <laughs> Keep her in line. <laughs> you know, there's a humour, there's a psychedelic kind of deranged perspective on life. It just completely won me over. And I couldn't help but think about rock and roll in sort of cartoon terms. It was like the monkeys at the edge of your street, you know, those, 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 like these sort of some kind of biker gang of uh, local snotty nosed kids with guitars and fuzz pedals. They are classic songs. And there's something so tragic about it as well, because most people never heard them. I think my favorite on this collection, which brings up an interesting garage punk disparity to me, is I'm a Living Sickness by the Calico Wall. And the reason that that's my favorite is there's a psychedelic psychosis to it that sometimes with these early garage singles where you just get one and done. It's just a snotty garage, suburban attitude kind of thing. But then sometimes you get a spiritual bent to it, like some of the best chocolate watch band stuff, for instance, where there's an element of it that you really were not expecting. And that to me is where it goes way above and beyond, where I'm a living sickness and obviously the Spades early version of You're Gonna Miss Me, Green Fuzz is another one. Yeah, I agree. Personally, I think most of them are masterpieces. They're completely unexpected. They're recorded quickly and it's just so much spontaneous genius. You know, that, that fuzz guitar on I'm a living sickness, me and Jay used to call it the bee sting. <laughs> sounds like a yeah. sort of a giant bee dying in a well and and it's one of those records as a songwriter i have to say get primitive that's like a first cut you know it's like that one of the first scars one of those formative impressions that you will never be able to shake off and it will stay with you your whole creative life you know i always say to my kids or any young person now it's like be careful what you listen to you know because you're going to carry that with you that's like the center of the onion and you peel away all those layers and you're always going to come back you're going to find richie blackmore and <laughs> get primitive 
I mean, that's the thing about music is you have no choice when it hits you. If you put something on, it's imprinting itself in that very moment. You know, it's like the eye of your inner mind. The aperture opens and whatever it is that you're taking in is staying in there. Yeah, absolutely. That's how it works. This is one of the greatest records ever made, as far as I'm concerned. Haunted, one, two, five. You know, there's a little turnaround at the at the end of the guitar break. I still use that today when I'm writing. If I'm ever lost for how I'm going to get out of a break, I will use that. And then obviously, you know, in England, we had the kinks and we had the pretty things. And they were like the British sort of parallel kind of garage cousins of these American bands but I found that these American bands they just stayed so obscure some of them had a future and some of them you know just got kind of broken apart it's something tragic about that it's like poets like William Blake you know <laughs> going his whole life with no recognition has to wait till he dies right and, and you know just like with the kinks I follow their thread through everything and to think that a group like Murphy and the Mob could have had a music hall concept album about schoolboys in disgrace or preservation acts one and two. I would have listened to all these guys, just like Lester Bangs talks about with the Count Five and makes up all these records that, you know, are just from the bowels of his imagination, talking about these concept albums that never were, in the hopes that more could be squeezed from simply 145. But it wasn't to be. Yeah. You got to stick at it. But no, but some people, that's their whole life's work. That's it. And there's something beautiful and poetic about that, too. And also for the non-casual music fan like yourselves and like me, I could sit in a room just staring at the wall, thinking about what could have been for each of these bands and be thoroughly entertained, never once bored. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I hope this discussion will get people to go and dig it up. You know, I have looked online. I've realized there is a copy of this album available for 30 bucks. It's not on streaming, folks, but it is on YouTube. Definitely check it out, because if you're not familiar with this strain of music, shame on you. <laughs> so the next theme, which is amazing to me that you only have one in here, is spiritual. And then the album, which I, shame on me, I had not heard before, even though I knew about it, was Radha Krishna Temple on Apple Records. So this seems like this would be a huge one for you guys. Yes. I think this is the one that, this is the sort of secret ingredient X in terms of Kula Shaker. And we've had this around the band since the very, very beginning. The first song that we ever played as a band was Govinda. And obviously Govinda is a folk song, thousands of years old, but it is on the Radha Krishna Temple album. It's an interesting story about this record because it was one of the early releases on Apple Records and George Harrison and John Lennon had been listening to this, to the Swami, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, doing his chanting, his Hare Krishna chanting, and they were really into it and they were you know, wondering where it all came from. So when they met the devotees who had come over to London from San Francisco and they were the first Krishna devotees in England, they hooked up with the Beatles. I think they just kind of camped outside Apple Records until, you know, John and George turned up. And, you know, one thing led to the other and it was like, hey, let's make a record. And this album that they made is, again, it's one of those albums that has all this talent, all this skill and genius, but it's very, very free. Those records are recorded very quickly and is very beautiful to listen to actually but it's this early synthesis of kirtan so the call and response devotional singing of the names of god communal chanting right for yeah the Hare Krishna. Yeah. yeah in doing the research for this and i did not know this beforehand but the Hare Krishna mantra, George Harrison came to appreciate chanting it when his plane lost control during a flight back from San Francisco in August 1967. So it was what he perceived as a near-death experience that calmed him, and that was, the, that was the beginning for him. That's interesting. I think he was on a flight with Peter Sellers, actually. I think that's what I remember hearing. It was him and Peter Sellers, and the plane was going down, and they buckled themselves in so tight and put their feet up up against the seat in front and were screaming Harry Krishna <laughs> together. 
I knew you were going to swing the topic back to the goons. <laughs> Acid, speed, and rampant infidelity. And that's before the band recorded a single note. Fleetwood Mac's got nothing on the mamas and the papas. I don't care if you love them or not, if they're in your wheelhouse or far, far outside of it, the Michelle Phillips Interview of a Lifetime series coming March 22nd on Discography is absolutely riveting. I promise you, you've never heard anything quite like it. Michelle, you want to take them out? It's hard to be really candid about so many disturbing things, and uh, you've made me feel that I can do that. And I am very grateful to you for giving me that opportunity to talk without feeling like I'm afraid of what I'm saying. Save the date, March 22nd. Michelle Phillips, the interview of a lifetime. You won't know what hit you. Yeah, it's an amazing album. It's incredibly beautiful. It was the first song that we ever played. And Govinda stayed with us from day one until the present day. It's been a lucky song for us. It's been a talisman. It's been one of those songs that separate us from everyone else as well in terms of our identity. And the first time I heard it was on this record. The editor of All Music, Stephen Thomas Erlewine, the guy who basically, I think, writes most of the descriptions on All Music, I'm quoting him when he says that Govinda pretty much provided the blueprint for Kula Shaker's career. Our song or the Radha Krishna Temple? The Radha Krishna Temple version. I don't think it did musically, but I think the intention gave us the blueprint because there was something very sort of prankster about it as well. Because, you know, they were spiritual dropouts. And I mean that in, a, in the positive sense that they had said, you know, we're going to live a, another reality, but we're going to do it in the world. We're not going to, you know, distance ourselves from the world. And the Krishnas at that time, they were very much of the 60s and they were very much of the counterculture. So, you know, to shave your head and to become, you know, clean living and into yoga and chanting and vegetarian and everything, it was a very radical thing to do. And then for the Beatles to use their fame to take something as wild and weird as this and then, you know, put it in the charts. The Hare Krishna mantra was in the top 10 in England. And I think the follow-up single, Govindam, which is an ancient prayer from the Brahma Samhita, <laughs> I think that was, that was the top 10 as well. You know? And people were watching this on the TV, all these weird monks jumping around on top of the pops. And that was the blueprint for us because it was, let's do something wild and spiritual and anarchic and pranksterish like that. Rock and roll, you know, chucking TVs out the window and everything, it's all very well. <laughs> but there's another side to rock and roll as well, which is shaking things up and evolution, you know. I had no idea that this was actually a chart success. Because yeah. here it was dead on arrival, as you probably know. But over in England, it peaked at number 12, which is wild. So do you see any kind of parallel? Because you guys are you know, friggin' mega over there. And then in, in America, it's not like the Harry Krishna chant, but yeah, I think your first record sold like 850,000 in England and a, a still very respectable 250,000 here. But is there a parallel, do you think, with a spiritual pursuit pervading rock and roll that there's a wall up in the West? Or is that just something that is more of an antiquated thing from the last century? I don't think anybody really knows the, the mysteries of the market, you know, or popular taste. I think every band, you know, have their time or their times and they connect in different ways. You know, for years, Blur was struggling in America and they, they didn't break through until somebody used one of their songs for the basketball tournament or something, you know. So it's all about timing. And to this day, thankfully, nobody really knows you know, what makes a success and how something catches fire. It's interesting because coming from this, you know, especially if you're a freak about all things must pass, which I am, if it wasn't for this record, apparently the Krishna consciousness and, you know, the doctrines of the group that, you know, he'd helped to manifest 
songs like My Sweet Lord, Awaiting on You All, and Beware of Darkness might never have reached fruition. It's really the thread that binds together his earlier work with All Things Must Pass. Absolutely. You know, it's it's a key part of George's development, you know, but also Paul McCartney helped to produce this record. He produced, Paul McCartney produced the Harry Krishna single and played bass on it. They were all involved. They had an art school kind of approach to music. They were really into trying out crazy stuff and they were into taking things that were very obscure and exotic and you might say highbrow and making it available to the popular taste and so in that way you'd say you know they're very generous they weren't just trying to keep it for the elite well it's like if you come down from the mountaintop and you can't put the kundalini experience into words you're going to sound like a crazed psychotic So for somebody to have that ability to do it in plain speak, you know, for the average person, just turn it on the radio, there can't be enough emphasis placed on how valuable that is. And you guys do that. So let's swing the topic then into the backpacking trip and how this consciousness entered into your music because it didn't begin that way, right? I'm guessing it changed a great deal after your Indian backpacking trip as well as everyone else in the band's spiritual path coming into being. If you had not taken that backpacking trip and you guys decided you just wanted to be sorted for ease and whiz, we might not be having this conversation, right? We already lived in a pretty strange bubble of, I would say, sort of romantic dreams. And I lived with Alonza in a town called Hampton. At the end of the road is the castle built for Henry VIII. And Paul was living in... Glastonbury with the tour with the festival but also you know a lot of ancient stories of King Arthur and all this and Jay was living in Hastings where there was a famous battle and I mean we're just in England you know we you're surrounded by ancient history and if you're even sort of slightly inclined to take an interest in that and then you mix it with music and books and psychedelics you're going to end up in a strange place <laughs> And, well, Paul was in a band in Glastonbury and his lead singer ran off and joined the Hare Krishnas. Remember that, Paul? So the year before I met these guys, I put an advert in the news agent saying, singer wanted for rock bands who won't run off to Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> and then within a year of putting those adverts up, I was playing in a band with Crispian. Like, my path was set out and I, I had almost like nothing to do with it. It's that I was just a passenger. Kind of reminds me of, you know, the early Fleetwood Mac, because it wasn't just Peter Green who was involved with Children of God. Jeremy Spencer, they soundchecked one day and he never came back from soundcheck. He missed the show, he turned up the next day and they said, are you joining the church? He said, yeah. It was a really bad (laughs) soundcheck. So I'm guessing it's changed over time. I mean, these days, without knowing right off, it seems like spirituality is just as important, if not more so than ever. So how do you get to that place now? I'm guessing popping a tab is probably not, with kids, the best way to go about things. Is it chanting? Is it vows of silence, meditation? How has it changed for you guys? Well, I just think that spiritual life doesn't sort of stop or start necessarily you know it's always with you it's just a case of whether you want to acknowledge it or not and with us it's just sort of grown and grown over the years and become more obviously part of who we are and what we do and we've all cultivated it in our own way you know like i chant Hare krishna and i you know meditate and i live a certain life and alonzo has his life his spiritual practices and Paul has his, everyone's different, but we all have a sort of appreciation that it is the foundation of what you do. It's the foundation of everything you do. People say, I'm not spiritual. I'm not really a spiritual person, but everyone is. It just depends how much you want to pay attention to it. Every spiritual narrative, like look at the Beatles in 68. They all went over to India. And when Ringo looked back on it, he talks about how there was just monkeys everywhere. So, you know, you got the one guy who speaks for everyone out there 
on the outside looking in. And to me, it rounds out the experience and makes it accessible. Yeah, but the thing is, you see, everybody goes through phases. And when we were kids, like when we first got Jay into the band, he'd been this sort of psychedelic, Farfisa playing garage fiend. And when we met him, we finally persuaded him to join us. He'd gone completely clean. He was practically a breathitarian. He, he said, I'm high on life, you know, and he wouldn't touch anything. He wouldn't even touch tea. And he stayed like that through the whole of the band from the three years where we were struggling right through K, through Peasants, Pigs and Astronauts. And then when the band kind of had its breakup and he went off with Oasis, that's when he became, you know, a normal person. <laughs> And now he's kind of like reconciled kind of like these two parts of himself. Everybody has a constantly evolving expression. And we were never like monks. I mean, Jay was like a monk, but we were just kids trying to, you know, live a spiritual value. You know, it wasn't so much about externals. It wasn't so much about what are you doing or what are you not doing? It was about what's important to you, what your values are, and how do you see life and how do you treat other people? Is there something that you do that brings you back to your center or separate things that you do? Without sounding like a guy who goes to the desert and does a drum circle, even just playing kit takes me to that point of just feeling like myself and feeling a bit grounded, you know? That's great. Thank I'm sure your band is thankful for that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you have your spiritual practices in terms of like, you know, what they call sadhana in India, they call, you know, the, the actual practice of meditating on God. But, you know, for me, like to just get grounded, I, I just go for a walk, <laughs> I just go for a long walk. I often will combine the two, actually. Go for a good long walk and do a bit of chanting on the way. I mean, that's a real fix me up. Now, do you compulsively go on the exact same path every day or do you find a new route every day? It's good to explore your environment. I live at the end of a dirt track. There's a lot of mud during the winter. So sometimes, you know, you don't want to be wading through uncharted territory, but it's good to stay fresh. It's good to be familiar with all the different routes in case you need to escape from the bailiffs or something. <laughs> All right. Now, here's what I love about you guys. One thing amongst many is that right next to the calm center of your existence as a band, you threw in not just the rebellion theme, but there's only one spiritual record and three rebellion records. And here we go straight into the mood glass smasher of NWA straight out of Compton. <laughs> That was the first hip hop album that I ever heard. I mean, I'd heard like Run DMC and stuff because it was on the charts. My cousins are in California and they came over one summer. And one of them is older, he's a deadhead. The younger cousin who's my age. He came over and his friend had given him this album and we were listening to it in my room in, in Hampton in England. And it was just so shocking. <laughs> it was so... I was struck by the funk and just the cool attitude. But I was also really shocked by the lyrics. And my mum came in or somebody, one of my relatives came in and heard it and they were shocked too, like really offended by it. And I remember thinking how cool it was <laughs> that this record was really upsetting people just by being cool, just by being itself. And it got a reputation, you know, very, very quickly among my friends. And and it was something exotic. I think it took quite a while before NWA were famous over here. You know, just the name alone was enough to freak people out. And so, you know, you got like the Sex Pistols on there as well. You know, it's, it's very rare, actually, when bands can genuinely freak people out. It's not manufactured, although there was a certain amount of, you know, marketing involved with the Sex Pistols and Malcolm McLaren. It did freak people out. It was genuinely shocking. To this day, Bill Grundy's show, if you watch that, it is shocking still. It is shocking. And also the movie, The Great Rock and Roll Swindle, Sid Vicious, you know, wandering around with Nancy. I mean, it, it, it freaks people out. And I remember the KLF got machine guns out at the end of their performance on the Brits one year, and they fired machine gun blanks into the audience of the, of the music industry. And I remember thinking that they ripped that off Sid Vicious at the end of, you know, 
when he sings my way <laughs> and then start shooting the audience. I know that's probably a sore point in America, but, you know, there is a frustration that has to be expressed by young people and you know it's cathartic well it wasn't never mind the bollocks it's great rock and roll switch yeah yeah, yeah exactly i honestly thought that was a typo because this is definitely my least favorite record on your list hi i'm dave gebro i threw my career as a licensed hearing instrument specialist in the trash sold my house and moved to the east coast with my wife and four-year-old son in order to focus on making the ultimate podcast for music obsessives thrive now i need your help although discography is rated in the top two percent of all podcasts globally the economics of this thing are tricky becoming a member of discography patreon gives you access to over a hundred more exclusive episodes and moving forward now every Sunday for only five dollars a month as a private first class you get our new weekly show by and for Discographies patreon family the Discography soldiers of sound podcast it'll be hosted by Rudy Fishman and given his sociopathic tendencies I'm sure it'll have a lunatics take over the asylum edge to it if all you want to do is show some love there's now finally a one dollar tier. Don't miss out. Become a recruit and get your personalized backstage pass for a buck. And for the cheapskates, homeless people, and all the bums sponging off mom and dad, don't care, just join. It's now completely free to join as a basic member, and it'll be the only place you'll be able to get our upcoming Lou Barlow, Corey Hansen, Mark Robinson comp, Metal Machine Muzak, as well as the triple album rock opera El Farmony I created with Joe Kennedy as the mentally regarded, and the ability to purchase one-off Patreon episodes. That's it. Back to the show. To me, Great Rock and Roll Swindle is a conceptual coup, way more than it is a great record. So I'm dying to know what the draw for this one was for you guys, because to me, this is like if The Clash of Sandinista was trying to confrontationally suck on purpose. Well, you're absolutely right. But, you know, it's a gateway. I saw the film before I heard any of the records. Somebody older than me had left a video of the great rock and roll swindle in the VHS machine. And I would innocently come down one morning, age 10 or 11 or something, and put that film on and sort of sat open mouthed in disbelief at the behavior of this band. And, you know, there's clips of anarchy in the UK and God Save the Queen. So the whole punk thing is there presented in its crazy movie form. And obviously Sid Vicious is kind of the star. Yeah, I just remember, you know, that same kind of shock that I had when listening to Straight Out Compton. You know, that this is your grown ups are going to get upset if they hear you listening to this. <laughs> Great rock and roll swindle kind of reminds me of the monkey's head, since we were speaking about the monkeys earlier, because first of all, you know, I mean, if we were to be honest, as great as the Sex Pistols were, they were kind of like the monkeys. They were assembled like that. And, you know, same type of impresario behind the whole thing. And the monkey's head had this very strong vibe of, I created this and I can destroy it too. Yeah, I love the movie Head. And now it's time to kick out the jams, motherfucker! Yeah, that's the third track. When we all lived together in a place called Swiss Cottage in North London, we lived together in a few different houses, but the first one was called Fellows Road. We all lived together and we painted the night's sort of psychedelic murals of King Arthur and Merlin and things like this on the on the wall and we, we hung all these painted wall hangings I'd brought back from India and we created this thing we called Mong Corner, which was a place that everyone would lie when they were too stoned to stand up. There was a lot of chess being played and there was some great record. We had a great record system in there that Paul had brought over from Glastonbury. And that album was there in the house. And we had a guitarist living downstairs who was in a band called Dogs to Moor. And he, he was very impressed and very encouraged that young musicians were listening to the MC5. And it's just that opening, the opening for, for Rambling Rose, where the preacher gets up and tells everybody that, you know, the time has come to decide whether you're going to be a problem or you're going to be part of the solution. <laughs> it's so good. That's what rock and roll is all about for me. It's just, you know, inciting 
revolution. The real pure revolution that MC5 represent. People don't remember, but the MC5 were the big brother band and the Stooges were the little brother band. Yeah. The MC5 were the ones who got the Stooges their record deal. But the real and raw, terrifying, scary as shit rebellion of those bands, which bottoms out in imprisonment, cocaine abuse, and real actual danger, it makes the fucking punk bands of today seem so anemic. I totally agree. I mean, that's kind of why we didn't really go the TVs out of the window route, because, you know, if you're going to do it, you know, you got to die, basically, or go to jail. And we didn't fancy that. And, you know, there's a type of revolution that's a lot more fun. You know, I use that lyric from T.S. Eliot, revolution for fun. You know, like, just keep it fun, everybody. <laughs> because the problem with MC5 is they got into politics. And rather than it being about, you know, a way of life, they started to align themselves with political groups and... You know, it's just a bummer. You know, it's going to stifle your individuality ultimately. And then the rock and rolls, and it's all over. You got to pack your bags and move on. <laughs> What's interesting about that, and you're right, is that once John Sinclair was out of the picture, their records, I mean, they never made a bad record. There's only three of them, really. But they kind of tried to reconnect with more Chuck Berry ish type moves. And, you know, to me, it doesn't have the import that this does, I think, because of the chaos that that represented. Yeah, I love the fact that they were the big brother of the Stooges and Stooges kind of long term, I think, sort of eclipsed them. And the MC5, they kind of went down in flames, really, of their own making. <laughs> And I think, honestly, to your point, John Sinclair's involvement probably predestined them to become the Little Brother Band, as history saw fit later on. Absolutely. But, you know, it's the danger, it's the excitement, it's the recklessness of all of these albums. They just don't give a fuck. No, they really don't. And they pay a price for it, but you get to live it through them vicariously. It's cathartic. Make sure, folks out there, make sure it's vicarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in leaving the rebellion theme, now we're at retro. And, you know, I am honored to talk with you guys about this record, about the Stone Roses debut. We could spend an entire show talking about this one. But I'm so curious to hear your take on this one because it's so iconic for you guys over there. And just like, you know, some of the things we've talked about here today, not as much over here, but it blew me away when I first heard it. Talk to me about your connection, both you guys, with the Stone Roses debut and with the follow-up too, and about the idea of career sustainability. That Well, that's a discuss. That's a wide, that's a pretty wide essay we're going to we're going to chew off here. I mean, Paul's got an album on here which we'll come to in a second. But what I think this Stone Roses album represented for a lot of people here in Britain, I don't know what it was like in America, but in Britain what it did is it created a fresh perspective on the 60s music from a new generation and they went back to it even though it was the music of their parents and they took the essential elements that were exciting about it and they made it their own and they brought it to life again and so when it's a little retro 60s influenced they created a whole new sound so a lot of people were listening to 60s records again because it was so evident on that album and people were listening to Simon and Garfunkel and they were listening to the Monkees you know and Rare Groove albums because it had all you know been sort of on full display with the Stone Roses so the 60s became fashionable again through the Stone Roses and the acid house kind of culture with ecstasy and LSD that reacquired a 60s connection. So it was a really big cultural thing in terms of how it affected the mood of the scene. And also, you know, obviously it brought bands back into the charts. It was like a band that wasn't so produced. It felt very natural. People were just kind of playing guitars again and it was nostalgic. Oh, did you have a similar connection to it when it came out? Like, was it unavoidable in England that you you had to find no. it? 
I was in the country listening to Prague and heavy rock, so I, I was kind of snobby about it because I thought it was indie, and I really love them now, but it's, it's taken me that long to love them. I didn't love them at the time. What was the turnoff for you? The jangliness. I just didn't get it. Whereas I listen to it now, I love it. And sort of even by the time we were doing the band, I, I start to appreciate it, and then over the years, I've appreciated it. You know, looking back at it. Which brings us on to the next record. It was Lenny Kravitz, really. That was what I was aware of more. That was my entry point into into retro rock, was those first two Lenny Kravitz records that, in Somerset, being out of the kind of hip loop of youth culture, that was my entry point, really. Uh, Until then, I hadn't even thought about modern bands having a 60s sound, you know? What's interesting to me about these guys, and I discovered them right before the second record came out, it seems like the template for Madchester and Baggy, even though Fool's Gold is really the only song that truly dips into that well, right? Yeah. Oh, hi. Dave again. I got to tell you about the next tier. As a lieutenant, you get an ad-free, substantially elongated director's cut of every episode. And you'll be getting the shows an entire week early from now on. And now back to our expertly crafted program. The Stone Roses record, it was a gateway, you know, for a lot of people. And, you know, you guys had the Pixies in America you had these kind of indie giants and we didn't kind of have that in England. And the Stone Roses seemed to be like the first young band that really freaked everybody out as well because they had kind of a slightly punk attitude. They looked 60s. They looked like they'd just come out of an acid rave, but they all had sort of 60s bowl haircuts. And they sounded, you know, like a cross between the monkeys and... (laughs) And Simon and Garfunkel at a rave. And yet they had the same sort of attitude as the punk band did of like, fuck the BBC, you know, which was some pretty impressive combination. And yeah, they did definitely implode. But it was exciting to see that happen. I remember just being at college and it was a big deal. I mean, Guns N' Roses was a really big deal, but the Guns N' Roses <laughs> was an American rock band. And you tend to, you know, identify with what's happening closer to home. Okay, talk to me about your retro pick of Lenny Kravitz. I had this when it came out, and I loved Let Love Rule. And hearing it yesterday, it was the first time I heard it in a while. It still holds up so well. It's my favorite record of his. Yeah, and I I really liked him when he came out. That was almost like an entry point for me into Stevie Wonder and Sly and the Family Stone. I kind of got into the meters bizarrely through little feet you know but i kind of ended up working my way backwards back to lee dorsey I, you know by the time we recorded our second record in 1998 all i was listening to was lee dorsey i remember loving lee dorsey basically having worked my way backwards you know from the 90s through to the 70s 60s even back to the 50s you know now do you guys like a whole bunch of other one-man band type records like uh, McCartney's first one, Shuggy Otis's Inspiration Information, Emmett Rhodes, are there other ones that come up for you guys? I like that Shuggy Otis record, that's really good, although obviously the hit off that was for Brothers Johnson rather than for Shuggy himself, but that's a really great sounding record. It's an interesting sort of distinctive sound, isn't it, when it's one guy doing everything? I'm not sure I like it completely. I mean, I did have that Lenny Kravitz album and I listened to it a lot and I played it to my kids the other day. But it is like listening to sort of somebody in a hall of mirrors, (laughs) just me playing with me. And it suited Paul McCartney because, you know, he has got that kind of crazy cosmic sort of ego. The vibe I get, I haven't met him, but it seems like Lenny Kravitz, if there wasn't a recording console around he would be perfectly okay looking at a hall of mirrors <laughs> just checking his cuts yeah i think mama said works because he's got slash on it as well isn't it he brought him in and he can't look in the mirror because he can't see where he's going all right so opera man am i excited to geek out with you guys on the pretty things sf sorrow and talking about the derivation of especially the english brand of the rock opera you know because i have a personal weakness for all the curly cues and accoutrement of the totally decked out late 60s rock opera. Yes, and SF Sorrow is the original one, isn't it? I mean, the Pretty Things were an art school band 
And Dick Taylor, had, with the guitarist, had famously been in the Stones. He had his exams coming up and he sensibly said to his mum and his dad, no, don't worry, I'll finish my exams and then I'll join the band, you know. And that didn't work out, so he was constantly labelled as the guy who could have been in the Stones. But he formed the Pretty Things instead with Phil May at an art school. And they had a very cool art school approach to R&B that was infused with this sort of just trying to be different attitude. So the Pretty Things started off as being like hairier, <laughs> hairier than the Stones. And they definitely reduced their audience as a result. And then people like David Bowie were really into the pretty things and people who wanted to stand out and not blend in. That was the band for them. And I think they suffered commercially as a result. They definitely always struggled to make a profit. You know, they were one of the great sort of 60s garage bands in the UK. And Midnight to Six Man is, is an amazing track. And then when they went psychedelic, you know, they were just so out there. I mean, they, they took the Sid Barrett kind of vibe of what was happening at the UFO Club. And they just went, went all the way in terms of trying to create these completely unlistenable little theatrical moments. And they did this single called Defecting Grey, which... So good. It's the yeah. greatest Mr. psychedelic Revasion, record ever Mr. made. Yeah, those singles, the Defecting Grey, Mr. Evasion, and Talking About the Good Times, Walking Through My Dreams, yeah. are two of the greatest singles of all time. Yeah. Again, I remember listening to Defecting Grey when I was about 13, 14, just becoming aware of drugs, <laughs> just becoming aware that they were a thing, that that was the reason why certain music sounded different to other sorts of music. And Defecting Grey was literally like watching a really, really weird TV show or going to the theatre. I mean, it was an experience and they crammed it all in under three minutes. And I remember the first time, you know, I hung out with Jay, that he knew what Defecting Grey was. He'd heard it and he could quote the lyrics. And I remember thinking that was really cool. And he obviously was a dude. So SF Sorrow was their rock opera and it predated Tommy. So I think unofficially it's it's arguably the first rock opera. It predated it, but then they really got the shaft because it then came out after Tommy. But it was the first one, apparently, that was actually recorded. Yeah, they did Back get then, the shaft. You had to record and get it out to the presses immediately. Yeah, those were the days. Amazing. Uh, so much for lead time and impact date. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah. done. It's out the studio. We're pressing it in the afternoon and, you know, should be in the shops on Monday. Amazing. Kind of like how Kanye leads his career right now. <laughs> um, have you guys ever consider doing an honest to goodness rock opera because you guys are fans of all the bells and whistles too especially for a frustrated filmmaker who's making music it's in your future i know it is yes i think the difference between a rock opera and a concept album is you, you concept is is theme based but the rock opera you got to have characters that you follow and we've never really so, done that that's true you're gonna get a perm please. i'm gonna get a perm <laughs> You need to get the perm. Just wear it out and get the perm and take your top off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a way to reconcile that with your spiritual beliefs. Yeah, he can't see, talk or hear, but he, he can chant. <laughs> Chanting whilst playing. That, that's perfect. Here's a working title. Last Chance. C-H-A-N-T-S. Yes. The Last Chance Saloon. Okay. I've got it. Thank, I've written it down. <laughs> Okay, so madness is the next theme. You guys, please run with this. I could talk about this one all day, so I'll shut my fat mouth. Sid Barrett's The Madcap Laughs. Well, we're talking about themes that make Kula Shaker Kula Shaker and, and have kind of informed us. And I think you can't have rock and roll without madness. You know, you need a little bit of anarchy. You need some romance. <laughs> you need a spiritual yearning. But there's always this shadow that, you know, if you stray from the herd, if you, you know, wear that leather jacket and ride too far away on the on the lost highway, so to speak, you will lose your bearings. And Sid Barrett's Madcap Laugh became a sort of a one of those scary records, really, of like somebody who was lost in a maze and took a studio in there with him. 
Because I lived down the road from Dave Gilmore's boat when I was growing up, but Dave Gilmore's recording studio boat, which we eventually went and recorded on with Bob Ezrin. Right. So Pink Floyd were like the neighborhood band, and they sort of passed quite a shadow over my imagination and, and Alonzo's too. And Sid Barrett was like the sort of ghost story, you know, about this guy who had basically created everything and then lost himself in the process. It's a- I always had the feeling that Roger Waters was so jealous because the entirety of the rest of his career <laughs> was built on Sid's legacy, every single record. But it was always from the outside looking in. So when Roger Waters sings about insanity, it's very well structured like on Dark Side of the Moon with Eclipse. So it's without the piecemeal insanity that dictates true craziness. Yeah, absolutely. I know you've got like the two paths of creativity. You've got, I've heard it described as the Apollo type energy, you know, which is disciplined and focused and structured. And then you have the sort of Dionysus energy, which is just orgiastic and ecstatic and completely spontaneous and dangerous. And Sid was just off with the fairies, wasn't he? He was very much of that Dionysian sort of, you know, he was off in the woods with the gnomes (laughs) drinking magic mushroom wine and his mind was too weak to be able to handle it i always thought that was a scary record to listen to terrifying you get pulled in i did in 1991 where i couldn't stop listening to it and it was having a detrimental effect on my psyche (laughs) and i couldn't stop and there are people like robin hitchcock who came out with the record i yeah which is my favorite robin hitchcock record where sid had basically you know shoved his hand into his brain and mouth and was, you know, moving everything that was happening. He's one of those kinds of artists. Yeah, that's an interesting image. Yeah, I did get a chance to talk to Dave Gilmore about that record because obviously Dave and Roger were helping him. They sort of felt bad that they kicked him out of the band, so they were sort of trying to help him make his solo record and all stay friends, you know, after the divorce. And this is perhaps an apocryphal story, but apparently he came into the studio, went straight into the live room and plugged his guitar in and was playing and they couldn't get any sound off the microphone. It wasn't working and they were all in the control room twiddling knobs and then they looked up and Dave realized that there were no strings on the guitar. (laughs) So, I mean, he, he definitely checked out or he was you know, winding them up. I don't know. Well, I mean, you, you hear the story about have you got it yet at their last rehearsal? And that's both winding them up and pure genius. It's both. And when the record came out, Gilmore was quoted as saying, perhaps we were trying to show what Sid was really like, but perhaps we were trying to punish him. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Jug Band Blues, you know, is the track that is the sort of foreshadowing of Madcap Laughs. He's got the rest of the band to sort of give it some shape. But when it's just Sid on his own in there with those crazy lyrics, you know, it's quite it's quite harrowing. But it again, you know, it's been a big influence. It's been a big influence on and me and Alonzo used to listen to that and um, play No Good Trying and Golden Hair. It's very romantic. It's very English. It's sort of Beatrix Potter. It takes you to a childlike place of memory. And it, it's just one of those records that you've absorbed, whether it's overt or not. It's gone in and it's, it's left its mark. All right. So love, the theme of love, appropriately enough, the group love, Forever Changes, which is an unassailable rock, pop, folk, mariachi masterpiece that you guys got right out of the gate that America failed to understand, but which is in a lot of ways the most generous album from the late 60s ever because it just keeps giving and showing different sides of itself as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, you you are keen to get this one on. No, I was in conflict about it because I gave you this list of records that I thought we had a shared history with and I didn't feel that with this but this and the doors, you and Alonzo have, have always hammered me about. So it has to be like that. And I'm kind of clattering away being a rock drummer. And, and you guys are trying to get me to play real delicate and to be sensitive and to be, you know, musical. And, to, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's been a point of contention over the years, really. I saw Arthur Lee do this as Brian Wilson did 
he comes over and plays concerts of his classic records with an amazing band of young American musicians who are fans and, and who are delighted to present it. And I saw Arthur Lee do Forever Changes at the World Festival Hall and it was amazing and it knocked me out, you know. I, I do really like the record, but I didn't grow up with it. It's a record that Crispin and Alonso put me onto fairly recently and I, I really appreciate it, but I have kind of almost deliberately not try to play like it because it seems like it's a really difficult thing to replicate because it seems so individual. Yeah, even for the band itself, they not only didn't try to replicate it, if you've heard the band after this, they're like a power trio. Wow. There's zero delicacy in the arrangements. The first song on the next record, August, it sounds like three guys punching out windows. Well, that's, that's, I can punch out windows. I just, it's <laughs> delicate. And I, I really love gentle stuff, you know, but this, this record's so diverse and so beautifully put together. It seems almost untouchable, you know? It's one of those timeless classics. You shouldn't ever try to replicate it, but you can't help but reference it. Even the combination of, you know, with the mariachi it has a certain mood and a certain romance. I think it's a very romantic album. I was introduced to it by a girl who was older than me, out, out of my league. And, you know, she was like, oh, I've just discovered this album. And I guess this was sort of like 1988 or 89. So I was just, I was still a, a kid. And so I sort of fell in love with her and the album. It was all at the same time. So my associations with it are with teenage romance and, you know, the yearning of that unobtainable love. <laughs> so, you know... You're right. It is, a, it is a generous record. I think it's a very good way to put it. It keeps changing and it has a lot of danger to it as well. You know, it, it does express that kind of psychosis that was going on as well in the whole hippie scene. You know, that sense of the world kind of splitting apart. The, the terror of the record to me is in the gap between the romancing of doom that seems to be going on mm. in the record that seeps into the cracks of every aspect of the record, but yet the almost limp-wristed fayness of the presentation of it, which completely belies the subject matter. And I always had this vision of Arthur Lee for this record as somebody who is like leaving your house, he turns around and waves goodbye, and you're shutting the door on a guy who's waving, and then every time you open your door, he's still there waving goodbye. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> the whole rest of his career, he thought he was going to die after this record, but his life just kept going and going and going. And that's the problem with romanticizing doom and romanticizing mortality is what if your death is not right around the corner? You have to keep living. <laughs> So when you become a major, you get yet another show on Wednesday. Either Discography's The Top Ten, our Buried Treasure show, Rock Cousteau, our Slag Off show, Queasy Listening, or exclusive limited series like The Private Press with Paul Major. And if you've got no financial worries to speak of, keep in mind that some of the higher Patreon tiers allow you to actually advertise on the show, choose the bands we cover, or even some of the guests we get. For the price of a cup of coffee a week, you can ensure my family's fed, build a music library that'll be the envy of your block, and connect to a thriving community of music maniacs all at the same time. Don't risk feeling badly about yourself by not giving. Patreon.com slash Discograffiti. Once again, that's Patreon.com slash Discograffiti. All right, well, I think a great pick, and I'm excited about the Dissent involved here. That gets me real jazzed up. Uh, romance, the best of the Velvet Underground, the words and music of Lou Reed. Two things here. It's interesting that when you guys think VU, you think romance, because I think of rot and decay, <laughs> uh, along with romance, of course, but also why a best of. Obviously, every single song on here is a masterpiece. But why specifically this one? Because this was the record that I had in my box of vinyl when I was 16. And I used to listen to this record with Alonza. And we used to play tunes from it. You know, it's one of those albums that you're not just learning to appreciate music, but you're also learning to play it. One part of my brain was into Deep Purple and into like learning how to play technically. 
And the other part of me just wanted to learn two or three chords and just get a vibe going. And there's something about Lou Reed's writing. It's so simple, you know, it feels so simple and so sort of throwaway. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's beautifully put together. I think the songs are very romantic, actually. You know, some French alcoholic poet said, you know, there's no beauty without decay, Baudelaire or somebody. Yes, there is decay involved, but what they're expressing is love and observations of beauty. Pale blue eyes on there and rock and roll, which is like this love letter to rock and roll radio and, and how it makes you feel. And it's very innocent, I think, underground for a bunch of, you know, degenerates. <laughs> <laughs> very romantic album even like waiting for my man you know that's their own mythology they're romancing their own mythology and there has to be a certain innocence about you to do that in the first place you know what now that i think about it he may have effed with heroin just to be able to write about it knowledgeably <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting this collection of songs there's so many different sides to this band that depending on how you twist the kaleidoscope. Yeah. It's everything to everyone. Not to me, though. No? This is a suggestion, Velvet. And my wife loves Velvet Underground. I just, yeah. My suggestion on this section was Summer I Got Funkle, because for me, that's got the richness. I don't really get the richness from Lou Reed. And I've tried with Lou Reed. We haven't tried hard <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with both of you because The Graduate, The Graduate's my favorite movie of all time. I've seen it, if I had to guess, 150 times. So you know, I'm so on board with this. Talk to me about what The Graduate means to you. Well, you know, it's that overlapping of a great album and great songs and a great movie. I mean, it's just magic. You're getting the best of both worlds there. The movie's making the music even better and the music's making the movie even better. They're actually working together in harmony. <laughs> just, that does not happen very often. Not only that, but there's sequences where they're using songs several times in a row, which you never see in a movie then or now. Scarborough Fair is used three times in a row at one point in the film. Sound of Silence is used multiple times. And that is really daring because in music you have motifs mm. and even in soundtracks you have motifs. But almost never do you hear songs used repeatedly. Yeah, they were using it more like score rather than, you right. know, let's go and chuck a song in here and have everybody dancing in a party, you know. But the music's got so much mood and so much atmosphere and it's so much of its time, you know. So it's a time machine, that record and that movie. You can't really separate the two. Even now, if I hear Scarborough Fair, I think of the movie. Summer of Garfunkel was the first music that got me. As a kid, that was what got me. The romance of it and the idea of escape within listening to music. Summer of Garfunkel got me as a kid. That's what got me started on the path, I think. You see, underneath all the layers of Paul, you've got somebody who's into this kind of innocence. He goes on about himself being a sort of heavy-handed rock drummer. But when he took acid, he went home and listened to The Carpenters. <laughs> On repeat. <laughs> and, and you know what, Paul? I'm right there with you, man. When I was a kid, I just was listening to these guys on a loop. Stuff like Big Bright Green Pleasure Machine, I would skip. Cloudy and like the really fey stuff, that's what I connected to. I loved it. <laughs> so is The Graduate, does that rate as one of your favorite movies for either of you guys? Paulie, come on. I would say that's even better than Scent of a Woman. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing that's interesting about the movie is that even though you know you can see it through this very gentle lens of 1960s hazy golden nostalgia the conceptual angle that mike nichols approached this and this is what i connect with is utilizing insanity as an angle through which to live your life that's what this movie is. Yeah. Well, the pattern from Virginia Woolf, did this come after Virginia Woolf? I think it did. Directly after. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely about people going off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love both those movies. For better or worse, it's been a huge influence on me. Yeah, I haven't shown it to my kids yet. I think it might be a bit awkward. What are the ages? 12 and 15. Oh, bad time to introduce them to it. <laughs> <laughs> they can watch it on their own. Exactly. <laughs> 
All right. So in the spirit of pure dissent, I have to say the last theme of concept is Rush's 2112. I listened to it last night again, this morning again. I keep trying to get into it and I keep failing. So I want you to pretend that you're a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on my door, trying to sell me on Rush's 2112 and tell me what the hell I'm missing. Crispin's just put this on as a concession for me. I mean, it definitely affected me. Doing psychedelics in Somerset in the 80s is a weird thing. And that's my only defense. It's something I used to put on when we were all living together and really just to annoy these guys. They would just, they would laugh and popular at me to turn it off, you know, is really what happened. It's one of those things that you're talking about rock operas earlier, saying that they petered out by the second side. And this is one of those, really. The, so just that first side is kind of a bit like the album that I made and never made. It's kind of funny, but I'm not sure that, that Crispin and Alonso saw the funny side of it. And Jay certainly wouldn't tolerate it, really. <laughs> Here's the thing, Paul, I know it's good. And, and so when I say, what am I missing? Well, I'm saying, what am I missing? Because I know that it's good. To be honest with you, Close to the Edge by Yes had more of a profound effect on me under the influence. But this is funnier than that. Just for its kind of comedy, Jack Black friendly shtick. That's why I've got it in there. I mean, it's, I, th I do genuinely really like it. But its influence on the band was like an anti-influence. It was just that they <laughs> Something to battle against. Well, I think it, yes. it became yeah. sort of an emblem of concept concepts you know that this sort of towering <laughs> pompous concept you know you got to be you know you could go one way or the other you can go sergeant pepper or you can go 2112 there's many different ways that it will manifest and we thought it was hysterically funny but paul introduced me to it and what you said was you put it on and you said i'm always suspicious of any band where the drummer has too much influence <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he basically wrote this record and then they created the music around it. Yeah. And then they're also they've got kimonos on, silk kimonos on the back. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing, are you really wearing kimonos and mustaches? It's just a powerful combination. You know, I know they have a sense of humor because a passage to Bangkok is about all the best places in the world to buy weed. I can't imagine them being high, but they are high. And, and you know, Neil Peart was a very erudite, you know, apart from his obvious amazing talent, partly since he's passed, I've seen lots of interviews of him, and, he, and he's so, he expresses himself so clearly. It's something that I can only aspire to. And he's just very in the moment as he's expressing himself, and I respect that wholly, you know. Yeah, he never said, um, once in his life, Neil Peart. I can't believe one of the most famous rock drums ever is really erudite and <laughs> smart and funny and doesn't take himself seriously. Listen, you guys, I wish this list was twice as long as it is. I'm sure you're thinking the opposite. We should have made it seven albums, not 15. But as history bore out, none of us ever said um or uh in this interview as well, as you'll hear. If you're a Coolest Shaker fan, you already know their entire discography backwards and forwards. But go back and listen to every record that we talked about here because these guys they really know music and that comes through in all your music and then for all the dumb yanks over here or listeners of the show who know these records but aren't as familiar with Kula Shaker you got to check out the new record Natural Magic it's excellent and it's my pick of your discography and nobody fucking paid me to say that I'm saying it from the heart I really love it thank you <laughs> thank you David that's great it's been yeah. a pleasure Thank you so much for joining me on Discography. Thanks for the chat. All right, that about does it. Stay tuned because next week brings a revamped redux of the most popular episode in Discography history, the rise and fall of Jim Gordon's super episode, with a brand new forward by Gordon biographer Joel Selvin, whose book on Jim has just been published. But that's not all. We also have a surprise bonus episode in store for you. The return of Battle Royale. Don't miss legendary guitarist and producer Fernando Perdomo going head-to-head -head with yours truly on whether blood, sweat, and tears have any merit whatsoever as a valid musical entity. That's this Wednesday, so look out for it. 
A heartfelt Disco Graffiti thanks goes out to my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Mark Robinson, Rudy Fishman, Becky Boyd, Teen Beat Records, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Disco Graffiti Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, and access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And if you don't mess with the Zuck, no sweat. Just email me at info at and I'll keep you in the loop. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper into the Gen X flag wavers of 1990s indie alternative gold is to leap headfirst into the David Pajo series, including the man himself rating Slint's discography. That's episodes 94 to 101. No Ages' Randy Randall rating the Jesus Lizard. That's 70 and 71. My interview with No Ages' Randy Randall, that's episode 88. The Bob Nastanovich rates Pavement series from 49 to 58, Nirvana episode 30, The Replacements with Bob Mayer 28 and 29, and number 18, The Pixies. Also, episodes 131 to 133 is Will Hart rating the Olivia Tremor Control. And of course, you also won't want to miss our Mark Robinson series, which so far encompasses episodes 128, 130, 135, and the next one, 136. Join us during the upcoming week. This Sunday, you can expect another deliriously sociopathic entry of Rudy Fishman's Discography Soldiers of Sound podcast. These are real people with talent and a burning fire deep inside, just like you and I. Get to know your new music-obsessed friends. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because this Wednesday, March 6th, we've got Blood, Sweat, and Tears Battle Royale with Fernando Perdomo, and then on Friday, March 8th, we're coming at you with the rise and fall of Jim Gordon's super episode with Joel Selvin. Trust me, you're not gonna wanna miss him. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Osiris. <laughs> <laughs>